You know, one thing that the pandemic has done has allowed me to do this podcast from wherever I need to, whether it's in a picture of the old family farm or some collectibles that I might have, the MTOM podcast can roll on whether you're on vacation or not. And that's ha- happened to be where we caught our guest today, Jason Hagland. Uh, oh, by the way, this is the MTOM podcast. I'm Paul Yeager. Welcome in. Thanks for uh, giving us a try here. We're going to talk about mental health today. Jason being on vacation, we're going to cover a couple of important things about that. Yes, you might not be able to afford say, a Disney trip every year or go to Europe. But there might be 10 hours or 20 hours that you're going to devote that might mean a break from the land and mean a lot to you, your mental health, and your family. So we're going to talk about all those things together. Jason is a fifth-generation farmer from Iowa. He's also in the mental health game. He has a background in psychology and mental health consulting and is presenting more and more things since the pandemic. So since March of 2020, a new need has arisen and a new way to approach mental health, at least talking about it. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna give you a couple of numbers at the end of this. Uh, It's also in the description of this podcast about how you can get help for yourself, help out a neighbor. We're gonna talk a lot about Joe. Joe's no one specific, but we all know Joe. You'll see what I mean. If you have feedback for me, hit me up at paul.yeager at iowapbs.org. Please, please, please share this episode with someone who you think can benefit from it that uh, might need a little bit of a help and maybe just a tiny way to introduce the topic and help someone out. On a hot day in July, are you a boat person, a golf person, or you just have to bail hay on a hot day in July? Oh, well, you know, there's been days I've done all three, but I've got to tell you, I love being out on my boat. That's my favorite place to be. Uh, And you happen to be uh, one of those that, are you a water skier or a tuber? Well, I I, I do tube. I kneeboard. Um, In my younger years, I water skied a little bit. Um, But I have to admit, I'm not as young as I used to be. And I have teenage sons um, that show me up pretty much all the way around. So, you know, I end up driving a lot more these days. Um, I did jump on the tube with my best friend from high school, who I vacationed with quite a bit. And so we still try to be young um, and not to pull too many muscles and get too sore so we can't finish out the week of vacation. I tell you that. So you are able to get away and that's important to you, right? to be able to break away every once in a while, you got to have a break from the farm. Absolutely. The absolutely, you know, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Step on you there. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I I think, you know, I, it's so important to take, to take time, um, to rejuvenate, um, and kind of, you know, recharge your batteries. And I think that's, that's something really important that we need to spend a lot more talking about than we do sometimes. It's kind of hard for farmers to do. I mean, one, uh, there's a certain group that can't get away unless they really do a lot of planning and ask a whole lot of favors. Those darn milk cows need attention twice a day. Then you have other chores that might need attending. How does one find a time and and explain to your neighbor, hey, could you help me out? Yeah, I think that's the hard part. And a lot of people don't understand that unless you grow up on a farm um, and you're really connected to the agricultural community. You know, so I think about farmers and ranchers, you know, livestock producers. I think about all of those folks who you're always on. You're always thinking about it. Um, you know, at, at this point, you know, I only do row crop um, production and and I'm still thinking about it. You know, I, I go around and it's real easy when I go into a corporate setting and say, you know, shut off your email, um, disconnect, um, do those things. Well, you know, I, I don't necessarily do as well practicing what I preach. I'm on my weather station while I'm on vacation. Um, you know, my brother-in-law's, you know, texting me to just see what happened to the corn last night in the wind. Um, you know, and so I'm still connected. Um, you know, and so that makes it really challenging because we all need to disconnect sometimes from our work. And when your work is your lifestyle um, and, 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 the, and the way of life that you know, sometimes it's really hard to do that. And sometimes that's at our emotional detriment. Um, you know, and I think more and more we're having conversations 
generations, the younger generations are having way more conversations um, th than we've ever had, just about what does emotional well-being look like? How do you take care of yourself? And how do you have open conversations about it? So you can say to your neighbor, hey, I need to disconnect. It's really important for me to spend some quality time with my family. You know, can, can you feed the goats and take care of my pigs while I'm gone? Um, because that's really hard to do if you've you know, got multiple you know, buildings and, and you're, 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 you're doing contract work. It, you just can't make that, that break um, because you need to do that. And so, you know, I think there's more conversations about that happening, but we still need a lot more awareness um, and openness to have those conversations. And you go ahead and mix it all together here. I was going to try to separate and show how everything is separate and how you need to categorize. But man, your two careers have kind of, they, they easily cross over. Let's start with the uh, the farming side. So uh, multi-generation producer for you. I think you're fifth. Uh, where Where is the farm? Ah, oh, up, up in Boone County. Um, so, you know, just, just off the, the Des Moines River. Um, between Boone and Ogden. So my, my, my family has been farming there for five generations. I think we started out in 1884 when J.B. Hagland migrated to this country um, as a Swedish speaking Finn. Um, we won't talk about why we got kicked out of Sweden and we won't talk about what happened when he had to come to America. Um, you know, throughout the pandemic, my wife did a lot of ancestry. We learned some things about our history that maybe we didn't want to know. Really? Um, yeah, so it was kind of fascinating. But, you know, going back, my son's 19 now. Um, he, he's going to be going to Iowa State, Ag Systems Technology, and he wants to be the sixth generation um, to till some dirt and do some work um, that, that, my family's, that my family has had that whole time. And so, you know, it really is a story of, you know, I, I grew up helping my dad to farm, um, you know, kind of learning it. Um, and my parents always said, this this isn't probably something you're gonna make a living off of, so you need to find a real job. Um, and I hear that a lot from farmers I talk to, you know, saying, you know, what what can we do or how do we stay connected? Um, you know, what do we do so we can still carry on that family tradition, um, but do it in a way that makes sense. And it's harder and harder to do, right? Um, it is. You know, we know, yeah, it's so challenging. And so, um, you know, my, my story and background is, is I had no intentions of going into farming growing up. I went to college at my, my undergrad at Northern University of Northern Iowa. I um, always do a shout out to the Panthers because we hear so much about the Cyclones and, and the Hawkeyes in this state. Nobody talks about the Panthers, right? Um, got my undergrad degree in psychology. Um, and so what do you do with a psychology degree, right? Um, I got married and my wife and I went to grad school in Pennsylvania and we, we lived there for five or six years. And guess what? We came back to Iowa to have a family. Um, and, and as we went through that process, my dad was getting older, um, started helping out more on the farm again. And, and here I am um, now, um, you know, we, farming it um, alongside my brother-in-law. And so, you know, we, we've been through all those stages that you go through, you know, the, the succession planning, the what do you do? How do you have those tough conversations? Um, you know, there's so many parts of that. And guess what? It all has to do with feelings, right? It's about the emotional connection you have to the land. It's the emotional connection with your families. And so suddenly I found myself um, after, you know, going to grad school and being an executive for, you know, a better part of my career um, at, at mental health agencies and, you know, hiring and firing psychiatrists and doing that work to real and, and secretly farming on the weekends. Um, I would go sneak off and farm on the weekends or go out. And nobody work. knew? Well, everybody knew. I'm like, yeah, I do this side thing. Um, never really talked about it, right? And then, and then I found myself kind of burning out of being an executive, kind of burning out of working 60 hours a week. Um, and, and found myself wanting to do something more, like, you know, wanting to figure out what can I do. And I realized, wait a minute, farmers don't really talk about emotional well-being. And there's lots of things happening. You know, I, I have some good friends at Iowa State University who do a whole bunch of stuff around emotional wellness on the farm. Um, and so as the pandemic um, came upon us, I started helping out and doing some work with Iowa Department of Human Services and FEMA. And we so started why, having conversations why, 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 about the before the pandemic, you hadn't really bridged the gap between your two worlds? Not not really. Kind of just did them separately. Really? Um, kind of just separately on their own. Like, well, yeah, I farm a little bit over here. I mean, we're in Iowa, so okay, you have a little farm. Um, you know, and so didn't really see the connection of how do those things, you know, that I did the farm as a hobby to, to, to relax, right? To get away, to sit in the tractor alone. And because I find that 
to be peaceful to me. That was the way I rejuvenated, right? Um, and so, you know, and, and as and that was at the same time I started doing more operationally on the farm, right? We had done some really some succession work and, and started take, I took much more ownership um of the farm, decision making processes on the farm. Um, and mo and moving forward with doing some things differently um, that we do today. And so, yeah, I hadn't really connected them. And so, um, you know, as the pandemic started and, and I, I kind of left that executive world, I kind of, I had reached the point of burnout of, I just can't do this 60 hours a week anymore. I um, started my own company, started doing some consulting and then ended up with the Department of Human Services and FEMA where we were doing outreach as, 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 as we all were impacted by the challenges we faced throughout the pandemic. And then we faced a derecho right? Um, the first duratio, right? We've had three now um, duratios. I didn't even know what that word was before we start all this. And we really started talking about, um, you know, well, how do we reach out to rural communities? How do we connect with egg communities? I'm like, well, hold on a minute. I'm a farmer. I guess I don't know anybody who can relate more to farmers than another farmer. And so um, I started bridging those two worlds, starting to have conversations about, well, you know, how do we have this? How do we talk about this? And how do we talk about stigma? Because, you know, it's really been only within the last five or 10 years, we've had honest conversations in rural communities about how stigma um, is holding us back. And a lot of that has to do with worry over our kids. And so the pandemic brought a lot of things out. Um, but even before that, um, we know that that not having open conversations about our emotional well-being takes its toll. And that's not just on parents and grandparents, that's on um, youth and children as well. And so all of those things are things I now spend a lot of time talking about and doing trainings um, and talking about where we're all at as a community. So that's kind of a lot, isn't it? it is. Well, it's plenty to unpack here in, in a little bit. Uh, when, when you say I'm involved... Uh, starting in the pandemic, I, I think we had a discussion within a month, maybe in May of, uh, of the pandemic, we did a mental health program and it was not something that I don't think our audience was always up for talking about. And then all of a sudden, everybody was talking about it and there was this huge push. Was that okay that it took a major thing happening to get us to talk about mental health? Well, I, I'm glad it happened because we're talking about it. I'm not glad that it happened, right? Right. Um, because we need to be talking about mental health. And, you know, it's not over. I, I hear people telling me, well, that's over, right? Um, you know, I, I've been following some data since the beginning. I'm kind of a data nerd, too. And the, and the National Center for Health Statistics puts out some polling every two weeks where they're monitoring um, all the states and territories le levels of anxiety and depression. And here in Iowa, in the last two weeks, um, the levels of anxiety and depression across the general population remained at 34%. That's some of the highest it's been since they started tracking in April of 2020. Um, prior to the pandemic, 11% of the general population, and this is Iowa specific, but it's pretty standard across the Midwest. Um, if you look at our surrounding states as well, only 11% we're experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression. So we've been living under three times the normal levels of anxiety and depression uh, in our general communities across um, our state. And so that's concerning to me because we've never experienced those high levels and we have all of these compounding stressors surrounding us. Um, so it's no wonder we're talking about it more because we're experiencing it more than we've ever experienced it before in the past. Well, and part of the whole pandemic early on was we were isolated and isolated more than normal. Now, those who farm are kind of isolated in general. Um, right. That whole thing that you talked about, riding the tractor to get away, uh, you're not necessarily interacting. But the interactions are always important for someone in agriculture, whether right. it's uh, going to the co-op or the tire shop or the cafe or the the convenience store. Those are all meeting points. And those were kind of, we, we're not doing those right now. So that was kind of hard for those outlets. Even if they were just small ones, they were vital ones for, a, for, for many. It, it was the disruption that was worse than the actual pandemic, if I can say it, not to minimize the pandemic in any way. Um, but it was the disruption. You know, the day-to-day -day business of farming didn't change. I still had to haul corn. Um, you know, whether it's a pandemic or not, I'm still going to the grain elevator. I'm still delivering corn. Um, 
you know, and, and so, you know, a lot of things didn't change. And that was kind of the frustration that boiled up um, was, was the, all the other disruptions. And then we started, you know, and then as things fall, we end up with supply chain issues. You know, those things were much more impactful um, throughout the course. It was the secondary issues of the pandemic that really hit the agricultural community much harder um, than anything else. And it was those other things that happened along the way, avian flu, derechos, tornadoes, storms, you know, you, you have this whole list of things um, on top of that when you already have increased stress what's going on with our kids the school disruptions um, all of those things made it really tough sometimes to manage and make decisions you have written some articles uh, one of them um, I read in the Des Moines Register was with Paul Lastly at Iowa State uh, Paul has seen a few things when it comes to farmers and stress and the sociology of rural America uh, in conversations with him, uh, how do you, how does he bridge that gap from old to new and say, are there any similarities pre-March of 2020 and post-March of 2020? Yeah, that's that's a great question, which reminds me, I got to get in touch with Paul. I haven't talked to him for the last couple of months. Um, great guy. Um, love, love reading Paul's work, and, and it's been an honor to work with Paul on some different projects um, over the course of the past couple of years. And yeah, he's so wise, you know, he's seen so much. And, you know, you know, a lot of times he goes back to, you know, thinking about the stress and what, what he experienced in the 80s, right? Um, you know, and bridging that to some of the stressors that were experienced. They're different stressors, um, but, but kind of putting a comparison in to kind of what things are the same today and what things have changed societally um, since, since that time, um, you know, and, and how do we unpack that and move forward as we think of things? You know, I, I remember I was... Well, how old was I? Eight years old in 1983. Um, and I remember in November of 1983, um, riding in the tractor with my dad, and we were taking our equipment and parking in the fence lines of neighbors' fields. And my dad said, oh, we're just going to store this stuff in these different areas. We'll go get it next spring. I'm like, why are we doing this? Oh, don't worry about it. We're just going to put our stuff around. Well, he had a farm sale in December of that same year, um, and he kept enough equipment so we could keep farming some of the land that we had um, because he was going bankrupt and I had no idea. Um, and so, you know, we need to think, but I, do, I did realize we didn't travel for the next five years, right? We didn't go on vacation. We didn't do a lot of things. Things were obviously a little tighter, but I didn't know what was going on at the time. And so sometimes we don't think about how the stressors we're experiencing are impacting our kids um, or impacting our neighbors or impacting those around us. And so as we get better at talking about our stressors, as we get better at supporting others um, who are struggling, um, we can have, we, can, we can do a better job um, of, of not hiding those things and bottling those things up, which historically, um, especially in the farming community, there's kind of that we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we don't talk about it mentality. And I hear that a lot still sometimes um, when I travel across the state. Probably the easiest question you'll get today. Is that healthy? Well, no, it's not. And, you know, and, and how do, what do we turn to in Iowa? And I, I you know, I hate to be the one to, I, I don't want to say it, but um, we even have beer that's for the farmers these days. And that certainly isn't healthy. We have a lot of unhealthy coping mechanisms. Some of the highest binge drinking rates are middle-aged men and women. Um, women are bringing up, um, are rising and statistically um, as having the highest binge drinking rates. Um, across the Midwest. And so we need to think about what are our coping skills? There's lots of really unhealthy coping skills that we utilize. Um, and so we need to think about what's the impact of that having on our communities? Um, and, and how can we do better um, to, to, to do things in a way that I guess is responsible um, and acknowledging our pain instead of medicating um, our pain in health, unhealthy ways? Okay, let's go back to eight-year-old you riding to the fence line with the tractor. Uh, if the, uh, the, your father is probably about the same age as what mine was at that exact time, going through almost the exact same scenario. Uh, A, would Jason do something different if that was his situation right now? And are you, at what point did you know something was really going on? I mean, you said you didn't take vacations for the next five years. You kind of figured out something was happening, but just use you as an example in a very real situation that I'm sure many have gone through. 
Yeah, it, you know, and I think my, my dad was very wise. Um, you know, and, and he reinvented himself at that time. He he started over. He 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 took up like like most people who change careers. He started out in real estate and insurance, and he finished his career as an executive at Wells Fargo, managing trusts and farmland across the Midwest. And so he took that opportunity to be really entrepreneurial, um, and and he kept farming on the side, um, which is kind of no different now that I find myself in probably at about that same time that that I, I found myself in a career that just wasn't fulfilling me anymore. Even though I was giving back and I was doing lots of things and helping lots of people, it just was the grind I wasn't really wanting to do. And so I went out on my own and kind of embraced something new and reinvented myself. And I, and I think that entrepreneurial spirit is present in so many farmers and so many rural folks because they've got that resilience and that grit um, that, that you see. And so, you know, I, I think about I've kind of followed my dad's path a little bit um, in a way that I never would have expected um, to do. And, and, you know, guess what? We're all going to probably switch careers four times in our lifespan. Um, I've, I've done a lot of work lately with a, with a friend at the university, or Drake University um, who, who does work in, in employment psychology. And she talks a lot about, you know, the expectations. Our youth they're going to have four or five separate distinct careers. This idea that you're going to go work at the same place until you retire, that's not a thing anymore. Um, and that's really hard for some of the, the older generation to wrap their minds around. You know, I, I do work in corporate places too. And we talk about that, the expectation difference between kids coming to work um, and, 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 the, and sometimes their bosses, um, you know, who are 50 or 60 years old and, and why the two can't communicate um, because they're on a very different page. Um, and so, you know, I, I see that happening, you know, in agriculture as well, right? Um, you know, the younger farmers, and I have to say, I'm not young, but I'm a younger farmer in many of the meetings I go to. Um, I was just leaving a restaurant earlier today, and a, 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 I, an older gentleman, he must have been 75 or 80, had an Iowa pork shirt on. I went up and said, hey, how are you doing? You're still raising pigs? He goes, I gave it to my son last year. I was like, holy cow, just last year? Um, he goes, I'm finally vacationing and retiring. Um, you know, and, and I and I think that kind of that, that kind of makes me take pause because, you know, our, our so many farmers keep doing it and keep doing it. Um, and what are they doing to take time and pause where they're at and enjoy the moment? Um, because that's so important to do and, and it's so important for our emotional well-being. Well, it's back to what we were talking about at the very beginning here about the, the importance of a little bit of a break. And I think of we're coming up on state fair time, and that's usually uh, when some families, that is their vacation. Yeah, that's a heck of a lot of work sometime going to the fair. <laughs> it's not easy uh, unless you're going for the one day or two day visit. Then it's a little less stressful if you're not showing anything. Uh, let's go back to that uh, generational change in viewing and the younger farmer versus the older farmer. We'll use ourselves as the midpoint. Let's just be nice and just oh, say we're in the great. middle. How about that? That's awesome, um, yeah. We know what the generation ahead of us and how they responded, generally speaking, was to keep it inside. Are, are there signs that the younger generation are not doing the same thing? They are more outward with, with feelings and open to discussing what's happening to them. Is there hope for this next generation, Jason? Well, of course there's hope. I wouldn't come here and say there's no hope. Um, there, there's always hope, you know, and, and I think that's part of, you know, I think about accessibility in rural communities of, you know, how do we engage in supportive services? You know, how do we find therapists when we need them? And, and, and fortunately it comes down to health insurance in many cases. And so, so many younger farmers may not have access to that if they don't have off farm employment or if they don't have a spouse um, who has off farm employment. And so I think about access to those supportive services. I think about access to therapy, medications, the things that are really necessary sometimes. Um, but I also think about supportive communities, right? So I think about, you know, what, what's happening in communities that make it okay to talk about this, um, that make it okay to be open um, about what's happening and the challenges someone's experiencing. You know, and that goes to our schools and how do we support our schools and how do we support our kids? Because that sets the stage for how we manage in our communities. Um, you know, I, I do think, um, the younger generations are much more open. You know, they, they wear stuff on their sleeve. And I think that's great. Um, but we need to find ways to, to communicate. And, you know, it's it's difficult. I mean, I can tell you that, you know, I, I, I plant all my rows east-west because, you know, science says that you're going to get better yields out of it. And there's people that drive by and go, 
why are you planting east west in those rows it'd be much more efficient for you to go north south because it's much farther i'm like well that may be um but i do things a little differently right um and so you've got a lot of people in the egg community that are pretty stuck um in the way that they've been doing things they do it the way their grandpa did it and they do it the way their grandpa's grandpa did it um and that may not make sense anymore based upon what we know and it's the same thing with brain health um you know just because we didn't used to talk about that doesn't mean it makes sense anymore. But that can be a tough barrier to break through um, in a lot of families and a lot of communities um, because it's pretty easy to get stuck and put your head down and just keep doing what you're doing. However, with the next generation, there is uh, the topic of social media. And the, the social yeah. media of a community is the farmer that said to you, why are you planting east-west when it would be easier north-south? There's a little bit of a pressure on, say, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook to post this idyllic looking farm or huge piece of equipment. And there's many that don't have that, don't want that right. for whatever reason, but yet feel the pressure. So maybe there's a trade off of something that our parents didn't feel that the younger parents are feeling. Or are they somewhat the same? Just the societal pressures are coming from a different spot. Yeah, you know, I, I've been I've been reading a book lately called um, I've, I've got it right here with me. I'm not promoting it at all, but it's called The Gap or the Gain. Do we focus on on the things we've learned from our failures, or do we focus um, on the gap, on always trying to reach something that we can never attain? Right? I don't have new fancy equipment. Right? My I've I've got equipment that, um, you know, it's kind of. I've got I've got the iPads and all the stuff in my computer in my tractor, but it's all it's all wired together and connected. It's kind of rough some days when you take a look at the wiring harnesses, um, you know, so, so I can map all my data. You know, I'm GPSing everything, but it's not pretty. Right. I'm running 20 year old equipment um, because I'm, I'm just a small farmer. Right. I, I, I'm not I'm not running thousands and thousands of acres. Um, you know, it's not about what you have. It's about how you use it. Right. Um, you know, if, if I can use my stuff optimally um, and get better yields, then I'd rather do that than have the payment of a brand new tractor and a 24 row planter in my driveway. Um, you know, so I think so oftentimes, you know, we're not all going to be a millennial farmer and we're not all going to have um, a YouTube channel with a million followers. Um, you know, it, it, it all what, what you set your goals to be. And so, you know, sometimes we set unattainable goals for ourselves, for our families, for our farms. Um, and so how do we get comfortable with who we are? How do we get comfortable with where we're at? And how do we make the most of what we have? And sometimes um, you need to kind of connect with other people and figure out, you know, how can I best utilize what I have, the land that I have, the ground that I have, um, the livestock that I have, um, and maximize that and find joy, right? Because at the end of the day, whether, whether you're working off farm, or you're working on farm, you want to have some joy in what you do, right? Like, I don't want to go somewhere and do something all day for eight or 10 hours a day and then be like, well, I really hate that. Like, I want to do something I like. There's always going to be some parts of something like, you know, I always have to do the same, you know, the same report every day. Well, there's always a little bit of that. But, you know, you want to have some things that you really enjoy um, in, in whatever career you choose to be in. And yes, we fall into certain habits on a certain weekly show where we talk about the commodities in the same order, the wheat, corn, soybeans, cotton, cattle, feeders, hogs, right. sorry, it's just the that's, nature. That's different. That's, that's different. totally different. There's, there's, some, there's some standards that are supposed to be out right. there that everybody gets used to. Right. Uh, it sounded like what you were just talking about is maybe building a self-care snowman. Is that what you were doing oh. right there? You're going to pull out the self-care snowman in July? Um, well, you yeah. know, we have to think cool on a hot, steamy day. Um, absolutely. Let's do think cool. Yeah, you know, and so it's funny. Um, some of the presentations I do included the, the, um, the, the self-care snowman. And it was about how, yeah, how do you, how do you build that resilience? How do you create time for you? And I love you said that Iowa State Fair is coming up. Um, you know, there's so many things that you can do um, to spend time with family or extended family. Um, and it doesn't have to be big trips somewhere, right? That Because that really doesn't rejuvenate you. Vacations are great. If you have vacation time, you work somewhere, I always encourage people, you should be using all your vacation time. If you're a farmer, you don't get vacation time. Um, so what can you do to split things up? Um, you know, take two days here, take two days there. Um, whether it's camping or canoeing or doing a float down the river, um, you know, there's so many 
activities to engage in. And so, and some of them are little to no cost, right? Um, spending time with your kids doesn't cost anything. And there's so many things you can go and do that. Um, it's just making that investment in time to take that moment to say, you know what, we're gonna take 10 hours next weekend and I'm gonna double up chores in the morning um, and I'm gonna have Joe down, the, Joe down the road is gonna come up and do the evening chores and we're gonna be able to take 20 hours and we're gonna go do this, we'll be back the next night so I can do chores that night. Um, you know, there's ways that we can do those things that just, it's not about quantity, it's about quality, right? And I spent, I've spent so much of my life worried about quantity that sometimes I lost track of quality myself, right? And so I talk about self-care, I talk about emotional well-being. Sometimes it's hard for my, for me myself, right? Um, when I'm on vacation, my kids had an intervention with me probably five or six years ago, and, and I got limited to one Facebook post a day. I get one selfie with the family a day, right? I'm part of that Facebook generation. I get it, right? And so they said, Dad, we want to be in the moment. We just want to enjoy this. And so, you know, I think I, I, I learned a lot from my kids over the years um, of, you know, what are you doing to create those memories, to create that enjoyment, and to take that time and carve it out for you? Because so oftentimes, you know, when I when I do these, I, I do um, workshops or I'll be in a community somewhere, I'll say, well, who, who what do you do for yourself every day? And, and there'll be half the room that raises their hands and say, I don't have any time for myself. I'm giving, giving, giving all day long. And the first thing I do is say, well, let's, let's think about what we can do for you. Um, how do we create a little time so there's 10 minutes in your day? Um, you know, I'm part of a group, um, and, and it sounds kind of cheesy. I've never, I had never done yoga, I'll be honest. And so, um, I've, I, but I'm a runner. I've been running 5Ks, and I ran marathons when I was younger. younger. Um, yoga is great stretching. Um, I never realized the benefits of yoga until, I, until I'm like, uh, I poo-pooed it. I did all the things a traditional middle-aged farmer would do. I know, it's hard to believe. Um, until I tried it, and I'm like, this is great. It clears my mind. I feel better. Um, you know, that's how you get to emotional well-being is also through mm -hmm. physical well-being. And so there's so many things that are really great if we just give them a chance. Um, so I challenge everybody to take a chance on some of these things. And what can you do for yourself? A little chaturanga can go a long way. Right. You know, downward dog's a little harder if you're not stretched up. But uh, I know there's a there's a good, you know, the cobra phase. I mean, there's all sorts of ones. So you just kind of feel a little bit better. I know, and it's my biggest challenge. I, I love to go running, but I, I, I hate to take the time to stretch. And as I get older, I need to take more time to stretch. So I'm, I'm learning these things the hard way. So, you know, I, I think sometimes our kids are a little smarter than we are yeah. um, because they, they know these things already. So I'm going to go stubborn. back. I want to go back to Joe down the road. Um, at what point do I have a conversation with him and ask him how he's doing? Or when do I hope he asks me how I'm doing? And how do I have that conversation and exchange with each other? Absolutely. You know, the most important thing you can do is if you're going to ask somebody how they're doing, um, make sure you have 15 or 20 minutes and are ready to hear what they have to say. Um, so oftentimes in, in nice um, Iowa, we say, hey, how are you doing? And everybody waves and says we're fine. Well, I guarantee one out of every two people you talk to isn't fine. Um, they're not OK. Um, things aren't well for them. And so, you know, how do we honestly and openly engage someone in a conversation where they feel safe enough, they can share with us how they're really doing. And so I encourage, I, I've encouraged some people not to ask how you're doing, um, because they say, well, I'm not going to take the time to listen. Well, then don't ask. I say right? That's not helpful, then, is it? No, it's not helpful at all. Um, you know, I, I, I love it. Um, you know, when, when I don't ask people how they're doing unless I'm willing to sit down with them um, across the table or stand with them, um, you know, at, at the county fair I'm at and say, you know, how are you doing? And they tell me, well, it's been tough. And I'm like, yeah, it has been tough. You want to talk about it? Um, you know, I, I think opening that door is so important all the time. And if you're ever concerned about someone, if you see behavior that's off, they're not taking care of things always ask. And, you know, there's all kinds of great courses. Iowa State University Outreach and Extension um, has QPR or Mental Health First Aid, which are courses that help you to have conversations with folks. Um, the, the suicide rates in Iowa um, are increasing. And so more people will die by suicide in the state of Iowa than in automotive vehicle accidents. Um, you know, we see the signs when we drive down the interstate, put your seatbelt on all these things, but we're not still having open conversations that, that suicide is an epidemic we really need to be cautious of. And that happens in rural communities at very high levels. And so if we're concerned about someone, 
we shouldn't hesitate to ask, how are you doing? And are you having thoughts of suicide? And there's so many great trainings out there we can connect you with. And that's part of what we do at Project Recovery Iowa um, is help people connect. And we have partners at Iowa State University Outreach and Extension um, that, that, that can help to bring trainings to local communities. We can also do that at Project Recovery Iowa um, because we're there to help communities to work through all these increased levels of anxiety, depression, workplace frustrations that we've seen occurring over the course of the last three years um, that really started with the pandemic, but it really turned into opening the door of so many other things that have happened that we need to be talking about. Okay, if I'm not ready to ask Joe how he's doing because I don't have the 15 minutes, or maybe I just don't feel like I can provide a, a good ear for someone, but I know that Joe needs, I can tell, I just know. I know what's going on. You mentioned a few of those resources. How do you find someone delicately or a point that can help that neighbor that might need it when all of a sudden, so, you know, some guy named Jason shows up at his door. Hey, what's going on? Well, I'm we not know just that's going to cause its door. own problem. Um, I would encourage you to always, you can always tell Joe, hey, you know what? And starting at July 16th, there's one three digit number, 988 is the National Suicide Hotline. And so you, you can say to Joe, Joe, there's a great number you can call and talk to a trained counselor and they can help to find some resources for you. It's just 988. Um, so it's really easy to remember. Um, that's a great starting place. Um, you can also call us at the um, Project Recover Iowa. We, one of our partners, Iowa State um, University Outreach and Extension, like I said, and their number is 844 or 800 447 1985. That's the same number that started during the 80s um, as Iowa Concern. So, you know, those are two great resources for the Abe community. And so I, I would always suggest to call that concern line at 800 447 1985. Um, because we understand the egg community and farming. And sometimes outreach um, to, to farmers kind of needs to be by, by another farmer or someone who understands, um, I, I hate to say that way of life, but it's a different culture, um, if you will. And so there's different stressors that sometimes um, other folks just don't understand quite as well, you know? And, and then that's really an important nuance as you, as you think about supporting someone and guiding them to resources. And Iowans are similar to many of the others involved in agriculture. I mean, we kind of go hand in hand with each other. There is a, um, I guess, a pride factor of sorts of, or, or maybe not wanting to talk about certain things just because we don't want people to know. I mean, that's a stigma in its own. Yeah. And, you know, some of the recent Farm Bureau polls, you know, every December, Iowa Farm Bureau has been doing a poll. Um, Iowa, uh, Iowa Bankers Association just did a poll. I'm, I'm not getting that right. I'm doing this off the cuff while I'm on vacation. But, um, you know, th th that data actually indicated that the more people are willing to talk about it than are willing to talk about it. So during that polling, over 77% of Iowans, farmers, rural Iowans, indicated um, that either they or someone they knew had struggled with a mental health condition. Um, and, and so, you know, it's much, it's happening, like more people our understanding of it than we believe in our communities. And, and that's just, it's because of the stigma, we don't talk about it. But most of your friends and neighbors would totally be understanding if you told them, I'm struggling with depression or I, I can't get out of bed in the morning. They'd say, well, yeah, my, my cousin, my sister, and I have all had that issue as well. Um, you know, and, and this is what we're doing. Here's a good psychiatrist you could call, or this primary care physician is really good at, at, at prescribing things for that, or here's a counselor you could call. Um, so oftentimes it's, it's, much more um, it happens much occurs much more than we think it does um, just because we're not talking about it. I, I just yesterday in going through Twitter, I, I saw a couple of people post, hey, we just lost two farmers in the neighborhood this week. One to one was depressed and the other was a farm accident or something. And it was just like, you know, check on your neighbor. Um, we shouldn't mm -hmm. need a reminder to check on our neighbor, but it is important. So is I, I've said the simple, how are you doing? Is there another entry point? Um, good question. Um, I think the best entry point is asking how you're doing, but you know, I think just paying attention, you know, paying attention to your neighbors. Um, you know, sometimes um, you know, kids say the darndest things, right? And so sometimes kids will say things that that help to, you know, kind of raise those red flags and, you know, might, might help you to reach out and just ask, hey, is everything okay? Um, is there something I can do? Um, you know, sometimes 
just doing the right thing, you know, taking somebody an extra meal if you can see they're struggling, just acts of kindness can sometimes go a long way, right? And so sometimes that's harder. We don't always know our neighbors as well as we used to um, these days. And so, you know, thinking about how are we really reaching out and connecting? And we all kind of, you know, yeah, many communities did kind of go into a shell, especially older individuals over the course of the last two and a half years, right? And so, you know, how do we get back to um, getting connected again? And, and that that's part of the challenge. And so, I, you know, I would encourage us all to just make connections that maybe you haven't made lately. But we're friends on Facebook and everything looks great. Facebook, yeah, I know. And so if we see Facebook, and I didn't mean Instagram, to, to, I did not mean to make this all about social media, but just a couple of things that you've said have made me put the two together. I'm sorry. Right. No, you're absolutely right because, you know, that's not real. You'll see pictures of my family and I and the sunset out on the boat, and it looks beautiful, right? Um, but you don't know what I had to say to my kids to get them to actually smile and sit with yes, us I do, for that like, thirty <laughs> seconds. Yeah, I know. Um, so, you know, that's that's not real. And so we just we perpetuate these unrealistic expectations because you get to see the one good picture of me over the course of the week. And that must encapsulate my life. Well, that's not my real life. Right. My life's full of struggles um, and family struggles and family issues and medical issues, just like every family is. Right. Um, and social media doesn't always show the reality of, of what it is, um, you know, to, to, to live as a person. And, and so that's always a struggle. Right. And as we as we doom scroll and so many of us do, we get on our phones and we doom scroll at night, you know, and we just look at how everyone else is doing. Um, that's yeah. not good for us either, right? Um, that doesn't help our emotional well-being. Um, it just perpetuates um, all of those other things. And so a lot of times, my wife took Facebook off of her phone. If she needs to look something up, she forces herself to get her laptop out. Um, you know, so there's things, sometimes the healthier things are disconnecting from social media and all of those things, because sometimes they drain our energy more than they fill our energy. And, you know, the whole point is, what do you do to fill your cup? Um, you know, you can only give so much, right? We only have so much capacity. Um, so think about what you're doing to refill your capacity, whether we recharge our batteries or fill our cup. Um, you know, you have to do that for you so you can be there for other people. So you can be there for your family. So you can be there for your neighbors. And if you're not taking care of you, um, then what are you doing? If I were at home in my office, I actually have one of the, um, one of the, one of the, the, the face mask that dropped down from an airplane and I take it with me to workshops. And I'm like, you know, whose mask do you put on first when you're, when you're flying in an airplane and then they, hopefully they're not dropping down when you're on the airplane. But if it happens, you put your mask on first because then you can help the people around you. And we're so bad at putting our mask on first. Um, we're so bad at taking care of ourselves. Um, we have to take care of ourselves so we can be there for other people. And that's okay to do sometimes. Um, it's okay to put ourselves first sometimes. We need to because that's how we get better and that's how we make those around us better. Let's close with this, Jason. Give me some of those numbers again in ways that uh, we can reach help. I mean, yes, our audience is a lot of Iowa, but I know I've got my friends in Minnesota and Wisconsin that are listening to this. And Extension in those states, I've talked to Minnesota Extension up before, our friend Emily up there and in Illinois. It's a local thing, but give me the Iowa help. Yeah, so you know, look, reach out to your local extension. Um, all of the local surrounding states have fantastic resources with their local extension folks. Um, here in Iowa, the Iowa Concern Line is 800-447-1985. And any of those folks from other states, you can call that line and they'll help you get connected um, to your local resources. The National Suicide Hotline, which is for anything um, emotionally related, is 988. And so I'm not going to give you any of the other numbers. You just call 988 anywhere you are in the United States um, or its territories, and you're going to be connected with a professional in your local area who can help you to guide you to those resources that you need. It's so much simpler now that that goes into effect. So um, I love it that finally we've gotten to a place federally where we have one standard number, 988, that we can call um, and to help us to really start having these difficult conversations. All right, Jason, close the laptop, get back to the lake, okay? Thank you very much. It's right. so great being here with you. Thank you so much. Again, if you have feedback for me, market to market at iowapbs.org. And a reminder, you can dial 988. That's a nationwide number to get help. Call now. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.